This is the Panasonic Lumix S5 II, a camera which in my opinion is the best value option available on the market today, and possibly of all time. Let's get undone. Gerald and Dunn. He's crazy. What's happening everybody? I'm Gerald and Dunn, and this is what happens, Larry. So as usual, some disclosure. Panasonic lent me this S5 II body and a couple lenses to make this review. I don't get to keep them, no money changed hands, and Panasonic does not get to preview this video before I post it. Also, I was not involved in the press trip to Japan and am not on any long-term loaner program with Panasonic for any of their gear. So I'm as neutral as I can be in making this review. This video does have an actual sponsor though, and that's Storyblocks. And I'd also like to give a big thank you to Camera Canada for lending me the original S5 for comparison and a couple other lenses to help with the testing. I'm a big fan of their store and always appreciate them helping with these reviews. Now I'm a big fan of the full frame Panasonic bodies. In fact, I've gone so far as to say that they're only a Sony autofocus system away from being perfect cameras. So obviously I was very excited to test out this new camera since they've essentially done that, added a competent phase detect autofocus system to an already fantastic camera line. They've also done a few other things to improve the original S5. So let's discuss those now. First, they've done away with the recording limits. Well, mostly. The only modes that you'll find any recording limits are the 5.9K30 and the 6K30, which by default are limited to 30 minutes of recording. But 6K24, 4K60 and so on have no limits. However, they've also added a thermal management function that lets you increase the temperature threshold to high, which will remove the 30 minute limit from even the 6K30, but will increase the temperature of the body. However, something I really like about Panasonic is how they market their cameras regarding overheating. They test and rate their cameras for up to 40 degrees Celsius or 104 Fahrenheit. I don't know of any other hybrid manufacturer doing that. This provides a lot of confidence knowing that you'll get similar results in studio as you would out on a hot summer day. They've also installed a clever little fan inside this area of the camera that draws cool air in from the front and exhausts it out the side, and you have control over the fan modes in the menu. I've been running it on the auto two mode and even during long 6K recordings, I never heard it once. Now when it comes to run times, in 4K24, I got two hours and 15 minutes before the battery died. In 4K60, I got one hour and 45 minutes, again, before the battery died. And in 6K open gate, I also got one hour and 45 minutes before the battery died. No overheating in any mode and no issues with extended recording. And this camera is using the same BLK22 battery that you'd find on the S5 and GH6. So the only recording limitation is battery life. But thankfully, since they've upgraded to USB-C power delivery on this camera, you can run it indefinitely that way. On the previous S5, by my testing, it would charge at 7.5 watts, but then drop to three watts when using the camera. On this S5 II, you charge at 10 watts and keep that 10 watts when the camera is running. Now with those recording modes, there's some things to mention. First, it's impressive that this camera can do 6K30 when even the S1H doesn't do that. That camera caps at 6K24. And I love that they've added more frame rate options over the original S5, like 4K 48p, and they've bumped the 4K 60 to 10-bit 422 instead of 420 on the original. And in 1080p, you can now record high frame rates in 10-bit up to 180 frames per second instead of just 8-bit like on the previous model. However, be aware that the 4K48 and 4K60 are still an APS-C crop, so no full frame 4K60. This is a bit of a bummer, but considering the price, I'm willing to accept it. Also, there's no all intro options on this camera, but there wasn't on the original S5 either. But that brings us to another camera that Panasonic is announcing, but that won't be coming out for a few more months, the s 52 x now those aren't available for review yet, but I wanted to make you aware that there will be an edition of this camera that does have all intro recording, ProRes options, external RAW, and even the ability to write to a USB SSD. It'll also be a blackout design with almost none of the white text. Now I'm told this camera will be $200 more than this base S5 II and will carry all the same photo and video functionality, but just add those extra recording modes. But if you don't need those extra features, you can safely order this S5 II and save 200 bucks. Also speaking of the design, when it comes to the build and ergonomics of this S5 II, it's almost identical to the original S5, save for a few improvements. First, the joystick is now a bit bigger and moves in eight directions instead of just four. They've removed the jangly strap triangles of the previous model and replaced them with these rectangular eyelets that don't move. I appreciate this. And they've upgraded the micro HDMI port to a full size type A. They've also thickened the grip a bit and improved the angle of the shutter button, which does feel nicer, but it's a minor change. Oh, and they moved the viewfinder sensor from the bottom to the top to reduce the unintentional detections that cause a switch to the EVF when your hand is in that area pushing buttons. This is actually pretty clever. Other than that, you'll feel right at home here if you've used any of the modern Lumix bodies. I really like the layout and ergonomics of these cameras, but if I was able to make one change, it would be to add a button to the top of this rear dial to lock it. I find I rotate this thing accidentally way too often. Now you can use a function button in the menu to lock all the dials with software, but not any one dial individually. 
My workaround was to turn on synchro scan so that even if I do accidentally change it, it's only by a single degree and not by a whole stop. Plus, synchro scan is just good in general for reducing the flicker of LEDs in your shot. Also, be aware that this camera does not have a tally lamp, but it does have a flip out screen with an option to put a big red box on that screen to show you that it's recording. Now, speaking of that upgraded HDMI port, I have some praise and some complaints. First off, I love how well HDMI works on Panasonic cameras. I like that you can display your on-screen information on your external monitor, even in 4K. I like how neither screen blacks out when you do that. And best of all, you don't lose touch tracking on the camera LCD when doing this, something I wish Sony would fix on their cameras. However, I do find it strange that you lose the on-screen information and display options on the camera LCD when doing that external OSD monitoring. It basically shows a clean feed only on the camera during this output type. It would be nice to have more flexibility here, like maybe the ability to show the big six button display on the LCD while showing the rest of the OSD info on the external monitor, or even just a mirror mode would be useful. Also, because of the bigger HDMI port, you can't rotate the LCD screen as much as you could before, or as much as you can with some other brands, which I did find annoying at times. It almost makes me wish they put that multi-way flippy screen from the GH6 or S1H on this camera. That might've solved my issue. But again, these are minor gripes. Also, I really appreciate the separate controls for the V-Log View Assist in deciding whether to show it on the camera screen or HDMI, neither or both. This is great. But they've also added user lights to this camera that you can upload and then either use in the monitor or actually bake them in with this new picture profile called Real-Time LUT. This allows you to do a quick delivery of files right out of camera if you know ahead of time a certain look that you plan to apply. And you can use this for both video and photo. But another fun application could be color space transforms. Let's say you were mixing cameras. You could load a V-Log to S-Log3 LUT onto your S5 II, select real-time LUT, and then effectively shoot alongside some Sony cameras and have them all be recording the same gamma and gamut. This is a really cool feature. However, despite all this praise I have for the HDMI output, I do have one complaint, and I've already passed this on to Panasonic. The audio when recording externally is consistently one frame behind. I would love if they could fix this. It's not the end of the world, but it's annoying if you're a perfectionist and it requires extra work in post. In fact, there's quite a bit of lag in general coming out of the HDMI port. Any movement on screen is echoed about half a second later, it seems, over HDMI. This is an area that could use some work. Now, while we're on the topic of log recordings, this camera has full V-Log, which is a gamma I'm personally very fond of, and it has dual native ISOs of 640 and 4000. So as usual, I busted out the Xyla 21 and tested the dynamic range. Panasonic rates this camera at 14 plus stops, and I can confirm that's what Imatest was able to detect. At ISO 640 in 4K24, we read a total of 14.2 stops, so that's good. But I also like to look at how many clean stops we're getting. So if we look at the score here next to medium, which has a signal noise ratio of two, we get 12.3 stops, which is a great score and right in line with other full frame Panasonic cameras. So basically we aren't losing anything by switching to phase detect autofocus when it comes to dynamic range, which is great. And if we jump up to ISO 4000, the second native ISO, we mostly maintain our results. Not a perfect second native, but solid performance. But there's a couple things to factor in here, oversampling and noise reduction. So first off, I love that this camera gives control over noise reduction. So for these tests, I put it all the way down to zero. But this noise reduction slider is actually kind of weird. More on that in a minute. Secondly, this camera oversamples from 6K in the full frame 4K modes. So I also wanted to test the 6K open gate for dynamic range as well. And interestingly, we maintained our 12.3 stops when testing the 6K on a 6K timeline. Usually we see a slight decrease here because we're no longer oversampling but my suspicion is that the changing codec is responsible for this. In 6K, the camera uses H.265 versus the 4K's H.264. I found when testing other cameras in the past that H.265 seems to perform better for noise than H.264, so that must be the equalizer here. But it's actually kind of gratifying to know that you'll get the same performance whether you record in 4K or 6K. Now, because these were all without any noise reduction, I figured I'd run some noise reduction in post to see how many of those stops we could dig out of the noise with low effort. Since some camera companies don't allow you to turn their noise reduction off, which might be inflating their scores, I thought I'd balance that out by putting a minor amount of noise reduction on a node in DaVinci Resolve and test it again. And when I did that, it jumped from 12.3 stops to 13.4, which is a fantastic result. However, I would not recommend doing this noise reduction step in camera. First off, at lower ISOs, the noise reduction doesn't appear to do anything. Regardless of where I set it, even all the way at plus 10, the image test results were identical. So at ISO 640, it doesn't seem to engage. But then at high ISOs, when it actually does kick in, the results are not good. It's a blotchy mess, and I actually prefer the look of the noise image. So leave that noise reduction at zero, and if you need to clean up your image, do it in post. But overall, the noise is handled well on this camera. 
Moving through the ISO range, I was impressed by the results all the way up to ISO 25,600, which is surprisingly usable. And you can push it all the way to 51,200 in a pinch. Now, obviously, I'd recommend skipping ISO 3200 and jumping right to 4000 to activate that second native ISO. But then you can cruise up to 12,800 with hardly any color shifting. And on the topic of color, I'm of two minds. When it comes to using the official 709 LUT from Panasonic, there's a subjective side of me that likes the result and finds the look pleasing. But objectively, it's not the most color accurate conversion on the market. It definitely leans harder into the reds and magentas than it does the other colors. And the greens and cyans can often be significantly underrepresented. And if you push up your saturation broadly to compensate, your reds become overpowering. The color space transform and resolve gives a better result though. And it's important to note that this isn't an issue with the camera and more an issue with the official LUT. But I'm pretty sure this is by design because when it comes to skin tones and sunsets, this LUT is great. So it just comes down to taste. But I do think it would be cool if manufacturers started providing two LUTs, a technical LUT that's color perfect, and then a more creative LUT that gives you the Panasonic look, for example. That being said, you can safely isolate and boost your greens and cyans without the image falling apart, as these recordings are robust and grade very nicely. And this camera matches the original S5 almost perfectly for color. And for a more personal test, I put the S5 II next to my main angle to see how it looks in here, and I was very pleased with the result. I was also impressed with the audio functionality. You've got 3.5 millimeter headphone and microphone jacks, or you can install the XLR module from the previous cameras into the hot shoe. It now features four channel audio, and when you plug a microphone in, it lets you increase the sound quality up to 96 kilohertz at 24 bit if you want to. I do wish I could choose between four channel and two channel though, because it's annoying seeing two empty tracks in my NLE all the time when I don't need them. And I also find it hard to tell which jack is which in a dark environment. I'd suggest making the labels white or making the mic jack red. But it does have an excellent gain adjustment, clean preamps, and best of all, the ability to change the mic input to line level, which lets me record directly from something like the Zoom F6, which only has a line level output and is often too hot for most mirrorless cameras. But on the S5 II, it sounds great. Here, have a listen to my main microphone, routed at line level, and then recorded internally on the S5 II by I tell you about today's sponsor, Storyblocks. Check, check. Sometimes you don't have the shot you need and there's no way you're gonna be able to go out and get it before you run out of time, run out of money, or run out of patience by completely derailing your creative momentum. And that's where Storyblocks comes in. Storyblocks is a stock media platform that boasts a massive library of high quality assets aimed to strengthen your video production. Their subscription model provides predictable costs, unlimited downloads, and no messing around with royalty fees or complicated licensing. You get unlimited downloads of 4K and HD video files, images, and motion graphics templates that you can use worry-free for both your personal and commercial projects. Their platform is intuitive and easy to use, and new content is added regularly with a focus on in-demand keywords to deliver up-to-date assets to satisfy your project. And if you're a Premiere Pro user, Storyblocks now has a plugin that integrates its entire library right into Premiere Pro. If you've never browsed Storyblocks before, I think you'd be truly impressed by just how exhaustive and useful the library is, and I encourage you to learn more about them by using the link in the description below. I also tested the rolling shutter performance. I'd say second to autofocus, rolling shutter was probably the weakest aspect of Panasonic full frames. Not as bad as some of the competition, but not in a place that I'd call good either. And I'd say that's also true for this new camera. It's not exactly good. For full frame oversampled 4K at 24 frames per second, I measured it at 21.5 milliseconds. Now my benchmark for calling the rolling shutter good is 15 milliseconds or lower. But to be fair, this camera is much better than the Sony a7 IV, which reads at 26.9 milliseconds. It did come across an anomaly here though. I also tested the original S5 and it measured 26.1 milliseconds, but I thought I remembered it being faster than that. So I looked it up on CineD's database and sure enough, they measured it in the 21 to 22 millisecond zone back when they tested it originally. So I retested it and still got 26 milliseconds. Then I tried changing frame rates to 25p and 30p, trying it in 422 and 420, turning random things on and off. And no matter what I did, the original S5 consistently measured 26 milliseconds. So maybe a firmware update changed something along the way on the original S5. I'm not sure. So I'd like to say that the S5 II is faster than the original, but when compared side by side, they look about the same. What I can say for sure is that it's not any worse despite adding a new autofocus engine, so that's good. It's also faster than the S1H at the 6K modes. The S1H read at 29.6 milliseconds in open gate, where this camera can do that at 25.3 milliseconds, and the S1H's 5.9K mode was 25.1 milliseconds, where the S5 II can do that at 21.2 milliseconds. They had similar performance in their APS-C 4K60 modes though of around 14 milliseconds. So like I said, overall decent, not the worst, but not quite good, but acceptable for the money. But the stabilization of this camera goes a long way to alleviate any pains that rolling shutter might bring. The IBIS on this camera is incredible, the best I've ever seen. 
Other cameras can match it for locked off handheld shots, but I've never seen a camera be this good at movement. You have similar modes to before, the regular IBIS and the electronic or EIS, which adds a small crop. I've got some observations, but first, watch this clip. This is me jogging after Lindsay with a 16 millimeter lens with EIS enabled. This is the closest to a gimbal I've ever seen a handheld camera get. There is some warpy wobbly stuff in the corners, but this is kind of an ultimate stress test for that. I'm using a very wide lens and I'm in this parking structure to emphasize those wobbles. But compared to other cameras, Panasonic has done well to minimize that warpy stuff and they pretty much disappear once you increase the focal length. By 24 millimeters, I didn't see them at all. Okay, hold that thought because I actually have an update regarding that stabilization issue. But I wanted to film this in sort of a vlog test so that we could test that as well at this point in the video. So I'm using the S5 II with autofocus, auto white balance, and auto ISO. So we can see how this camera just works. If you let it do everything, I need vlog with it. And I have the stabilization set to just basic IBIS, no EIS. And I'm using the 20 to 60 millimeter kit lens at 20 millimeters at f3.5. And I'm gonna walk through some different lighting scenarios here so we can see how it adjusts when it's brightly exposed and when it gets dark to see how smoothly it adjusts and how well it does for both autofocus and auto exposure. I would prefer to do this test outside, but it has been raining like crazy all week. Okay, so I spoke to Panasonic about the warpy wobbles I was experiencing, and apparently they noticed them too, and so they had some engineers work on an update, and they released that as like another pre-production firmware update that I have now installed on this camera, and that you guys will get all of these updates by the time the camera ships. And apparently they were able to fix the warpiness up to as wide as 20 millimeters, which of course is in line with my observations that the wobbles tend to disappear around 24 millimeter. Apparently it's even better than that. Apparently it's corrected all the way up to 20 millimeters. So I'm gonna go back down to the parking garage now and do another one of those jogging tests. And I will turn EIS on to see how it handles the warpiness at 20 mil. With some brands, you don't get many wobbles, but you don't get very strong stabilization. With other brands, the warpiness overpowers the benefits of even using stabilization. But with the S5 II, I feel like they struck a nice balance that makes it very much worth using even in extreme situations, like I've shown here. But if they're able to improve this warpiness problem a little bit more in firmware, that would be stellar. I'd personally recommend disabling EIS for anything less intense, you just don't need it. So you can reduce your issues and remove the crop and still get fantastic stabilization for more basic movements. Here's a sample of me doing a brisk, heavy-footed walk at 35 millimeters on the S5 II with only basic IBIS, and compared to the original S5, you can see a huge improvement. It also just feels so smooth and satisfying for doing handheld pans. Truly the best stabilization I've ever used. Now something else worth noting about that stabilization test is how extreme it is for autofocus. We've got Lindsay wearing a black coat in a gray environment, walking into bright lights that are visible in the frame, and the rest of the scene is low contrast and I purposefully underexposed it, and the autofocus performed brilliantly. I was using the human detection mode and it had no problems putting a box around Lindsay's head or back or full body depending on my distance to her and it kept her in focus like 99% of the time. I've done extensive tests on this new autofocus system and I might even make a whole dedicated video about it but the big question is, have they done it? Has Panasonic added an AF system to their cameras that gives me enough confidence to rely on it? Absolutely. It's early days and there are some quirks but it is shockingly good. It might honestly be the second best system out there now, leapfrogging Fuji, Nikon, and even Canon, and rubbing shoulders with Sony. There's still a couple things that Sony does better, but they're minor for my use and more apparent in photography. The fact is you can stick this camera on a tripod, point it at your face, and it'll keep you in focus for however long you need to yell at the camera without anything weird going on, like pulsing on out of focus objects. There are some caveats and best practices though. So like I said, I'm gonna make a whole video about that closer to shipping date so that anyone getting the camera will be able to get excellent autofocus out of it by just watching my guide. And in the meantime, I'm gonna keep reporting the little quirks that I find to Panasonic as they seem eager to fix them. But honestly, this is a huge win for Panasonic and I would feel completely comfortable shooting all my YouTube videos with this camera on autofocus. Some things you should be aware of right now though, it does track animals like cats, for example, but it doesn't have animal IAF. It just puts a box around the whole cat. It does a solid job, but Sony does this better. And over and under exposure isn't the best in the game. Overexposure is pretty good, actually. I had great results up to about five stops over, and you can even do six stops, but it gets a little shaky. But underexposure was a bit less impressive. I only felt confident about two, two and a half stops under. Three stops under was mostly good, but I wouldn't do anything mission critical with it, and then four stops under was pretty wonky. So if your main mission in life is autofocusing in very dim environments, I'd probably still get the Sony. But for anything less extreme, 
this camera has you covered. Now when it comes to photo, I never really had that big of an issue with Panasonic's autofocus for stills, but I did notice an improvement here. It just feels peppier and more responsive, and there's less of that flickering from the contrast AF, and the blackout is reduced too. Basically, it's more pleasant looking through the EVF when burst shooting. And now that they've added a 30 FPS burst mode, this new phase of tech system is gonna be much more important. But if you're like me and we're mostly happy with the photo capabilities of the S5, you're getting the same comforts, but now with some quality of life upgrades. To be honest though, it does feel a bit sluggish compared to the latest Sony cameras in stills mode. I haven't done any intensive testing with action or sports photography, but it just feels like it takes an extra beat to change subjects, and there's a slight delay when racking long distances. The JPEGs look great though, but I'll reserve any image quality assessments until I've processed some RAWs. And I'd recommend you check out some action photographer's opinions if you're considering buying this camera for that purpose. What I can say, however, is that if you're a video first shooter who just needs to grab some nice looking stills as a secondary, where the highest speed photo tracking isn't a necessity, this camera will suit you perfectly fine. And it might even be better than that, I just don't wanna make those claims without more thorough testing. Oh, and if you wanted the specs on that new autofocus engine, it's a 779 point hybrid phase detect system. So you're getting a best of both worlds scenario like Sony, where phase can do the heavy lifting and contrast detection can refine and assist. It has face and eye tracking, human body tracking, touch area and touch tracking, and that animal tracking that I mentioned earlier. The only limitation I found that you might wanna know about before buying is that if you have the camera set to 5.9 or 6K and you have HDMI connected, you lose your subject detection capabilities. You're fine if you shoot at 4K 60 or lower though. I could see this presenting an issue for people who wanna use face tracking autofocus while recording 6K internally and monitor on a bigger screen externally. If that's your use case, you're gonna to wanna to record in 4K internally instead, which is still oversampled and a great image, but you lose the open gate flexibility. But aside from that quirk, the recording options are terrific. This camera has two SD card slots, both UHS-2 now, and you have relay and backup recording modes to those slots. You can also record externally while recording to both slots internally for double redundancy if needed. And as you'd expect from a Panasonic camera, it's loaded with a bunch of cool functions like focus transitions, live cropping, and a full suite of anamorphic features, including a dedicated 3.3K 4x3 anamorphic mode at up to 48 frames per second with stabilization. But anamorphic isn't really something I play around with too much, so if you wanna know more about that, I recommend you watch Josh's video over at Make Art Now for a full breakdown on his anamorphic experience with this camera. It also has a ton of useful exposure tools like adjustable waveforms, vector scopes, two simultaneous levels of zebras, a luminance spot meter for dialing in middle gray, and an excellent white balance tool. Although to be fair, even though Panasonic was one of the first mirrorless cameras to have a great white balance target, it's actually a bit dated now. I would love the ability to reposition and resize it like I can on the newer Sony cameras, and I'd like it if it told me the reading after I acquired it. But it's still accurate and fast, so that's good. And of course, this camera has shutter angle, Honestly, if there's a feature that can make me switch systems, it's shutter angle. Why can't other manufacturers just put that in their hybrid cameras? And it's for these reasons that in the beginning of this video, I said that this might be the best value camera of all time. Cameras in this price bracket are usually all about compromises. Sony's offerings, for example, have great dynamic range and autofocus, but terrible rolling shutter and a lack of professional video features. Canon, on the other hand, sacrifices dynamic range to achieve their other strengths. And then Panasonic, offered all those great video features with excellent menus and ergonomics, but had the worst autofocus. As a consumer, the only way you could truly have it all was by spending thousands of dollars more. So it came down to which compromises were right for you. I don't feel that way anymore. Sure, this camera isn't perfect. It doesn't have much in the way of time code support. The 4K60 is cropped and the rolling shutter is still a bit slower than I'd like. But they did a great job of putting a reliable autofocus system into an already stellar camera and they're launching it at 2,000 US dollars. That's cheaper than the a7 IV, the GH6, the Fuji X-H2S, and the Canon R6 II. And in most of those cases, you'd be saving up to $500 by choosing this camera while also conceding fewer compromises. I feel like to truly beat this camera, you gotta spend at least $1,500 more. And from a value perspective, that's very impressive. The last camera that came out at 2,000 US dollars that had me this excited was the original Sony a7 III back in 2018. In fact, I called that camera the best value camera of all time. And while we should expect technology to improve over the years, I wasn't expecting this S5 II to be so much better than that previous value champion at the same price that camera launched at nearly five years ago. So here we are, the Panasonic S5 II, the best bang for your buck in a camera today, and in my opinion, the most feature-rich camera for the money ever released. All right, I'm done. <laughs>